Welcome to Like It Is. In an earlier program that we ran as a special three-part series entitled A Decade of Struggle, we included an interview with a man who worked as an informer for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We didn't show all of that interview, however, because of time limitations. We do feel, nonetheless, that we should air as much as possible of that interview because of the gravity of the information it contains. This edition of Like It Is will be devoted solely to that end. The name of the informant that we interviewed is Dothard Perry, also known as Ed Riggs, also known as Bill Perry, also known as Othello. He worked for the FBI as an informer who infiltrated various black organizations during the 1960s. Ours is the only full-face on-camera interview that he has conducted thus far. Now, we interviewed him on two separate occasions. So, for purposes of continuity, we've edited this piece, going from one interview to another according to subject areas. We began with his account of how he was recruited by the FBI. I was a student at uh, Sacramento City College and Sacramento State College. Uh, I was stopped in the parking lot one day by a special agent by the name of Frank. He uh, told me uh, a little bit about that he knew that I worked in military intelligence and how would I like to work for him. And also that I knew certain people in the so-called black radical fringe that they would be very interested in finding different information out about. I told him that uh, my uh, term for military intelligence had been very short-lived that I was not interested in them, and I wasn't interested in him either. By now, this must have been 1968-ish. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the following month, um, I was going to school on a federal grant and also a VA loan check. Uh, my check didn't come down, either one. I had bought a um, oscilloscope for a television communications class that I was taking from uh, a person that I didn't even know. He just had the oscilloscope for sale and it was very cheap, so I bought it. Uh, since my checks hadn't came down, being a student, and I was taking like close to, I think, about 23 units, something like that, it was a very heavy course load. Uh, I couldn't work and go to school at the same time. So I decided I would take the oscilloscope down to the pawn shop, pawn it, and use that money until my checks came. I went down, I pawned the oscilloscope. As I came out, I got busted. Possession of stolen property. It seems that someone had broke into Sacramento City College and had stolen the oscilloscope along with quite a few other things. So what happened? Well, uh, I was taken to court due to the uh, uh, due to uh, a friend of mine attorney in Sacramento that I had been working for uh, he intervened for me and it was broken down to misdemeanor possession of stolen property which I was given three years summary probation for uh, let me clarify this summary probation means that all you have to do is you write a letter into the probation officer every month and you say, well, I've been a good boy this month. Bye, you know. Uh, I got an offer for a uh, scholarship at Los Angeles City College, which I took advantage of, and I started going to Los Angeles City College and UCLA in Los Angeles. Coming out of uh, LACC, uh, from the school one day, I was met again by the same special agent who said that um, he wanted to talk to me and uh, the offer was still good about me working for him. Again, I told him no, I was not interested. Then, told me that uh, I should be interested because they could help me with a problem that I had. And I told him I didn't have any problems that I knew of. 
He said, oh, yes, you remember the uh, possession of stolen? I said, yeah, well, that's summary probation, man. I just write a letter in every month. He said, oh, no, no, that's not summary probation. Um, it turned out it, it's, a, it's a felony probation for three years, which means you have to report in every week. To bring it down to a nutshell, what happened? What happened was that uh, as far as they were concerned, it was felony probation now. And if uh, when you jump probation, that means they can put you in for the rest of the term of the probation, which came through about two years and, and ten months. And so they threatened you with that? Yes, they did. Why didn't you stand up to that? I called the probation office in Sacramento first. They told me a warrant was out for my arrest and that I was going to jail. Did you have any particular fear of jail? Yes. Uh, I like to, I don't like to be shut in. I have a very, very dark fear of being shut up anywhere. Uh, to How would they have known this? Uh, the only way they could have known that is from my psychological uh, profile when I went into military intelligence, which they take on all people that work in military intelligence. So you bent and you decided to go to work for them? Yes. How would you say that most of those who are doing the same thing that you did uh, have gotten into that behavior? The same way you did, they were coerced? Of course, pressure. Um, some 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 can take it for uh I, I think some do it might do it for the pay for the feeling of power um it's uh it's a natural syndrome for a powerless person given giving uh a pedestal where he can direct or he can he can say well this man goes to jail or this man stays free uh they get a feeling of security from it Mm -hmm. For the FBI, did you get an indoctrination or did you just start cold? No, no, I got an indoctrination. Uh, it started off with uh, camera surveillance, uh, surveillance <coughs> excuse me, camera surveillance, uh, electronic techniques, and surveil surveillance, um, shadowing, uh, the obtaining of, of um, let's say, letters, empty envelopes. Um, instructions on how to go to somebody's garbage containers and pick out useful items. You'd be surprised at the things that they take out of a garbage can, by the way. I mean, anywhere from the leftover food from breakfast, just to know what this guy eats for breakfast, you know. Uh, when they become interested in a person or a group of people, they try to find out as much as they possibly can, psychologically, and uh, academically and, and, and social-wise. Uh, who, who do they run with? Do they go to certain nightclubs? Does this one have a sex hang-up? Uh, is the man impudent? You know, anything. Anything that can be used later on. How long was this indoctrination process? Uh, it lasts anywhere from two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most sophisticated uh, equipment that you use as far as eavesdropping is concerned? The uh, video setup, and also I uh, work with the new, uh, I think it's called parabolic reflectors uh, for sound pickup. Mm -hmm. a very interesting piece of equipment. How is that used? Okay, it's, it reminds you of a disc. Oh, have you ever seen those uh, radio scopes? Yeah. You know how they're a disc and then there is a cone behind it like cone yeah. in the center right yeah okay these parabolic reflectors were just like that except a smaller version and you would point it in the direction of where you wanted to pick up the sound from and how far away can it pick up sound oh i think it was what anywhere from the ones i use from 200 to 500 yards what oh yeah distinct distinct very distinct you could be in a building like, like, say, we're here right now, okay? Okay, not the next building, but the building behind. Let's say it's a little bit taller. Okay, I could point that parabolic reflector from there to this window, and I could pick up. That's how good it was. Through the window? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The window didn't have to be open. The window didn't have to be open at all.
How did you, uh, how does one go about tailing a person? Uh, describe that. Is there a particular art you say you have to be taught that? Well, there is a particular art to it, but, you know, okay, let me, let me state, number one, the easiest way is to get close to the person so you can run with them. You know, that's the best way. Okay, um, the second best way is the thing I've called uh, trial and error observation, where you would go around and you would follow this guy, let's say, from a distance of anywhere from a half block to a block, as long as you can keep him in sight. And then you find out certain locales or certain places that this man goes to every day. Now, if you can get a set pattern of places that this man goes to every day, you got him down. You got him down. That's what they needed to know. So after a couple of weeks, you were ready to go to work? Uh, I wasn't ready, but I, I went to work, yeah. Do you know if this indoctrination period is more sophisticated today? Probably much more so sophisticated for the simple reason that they, they're they probably more severe on them as far as rating is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because of all the disclosures that are being made against them. I think they're being very, very careful. And when they sink their, sink their hooks in, I think they're making sure that it is tight, airtight. In your experience, did you ever see the FBI try to sway newspaper or media news? Oh, hey, let me hey, let me run this down to you. L.A. Times? L.A. Times, man. I went over there and picked up press passes from certain people over there. Uh, uh, let me see, uh, some people that work for NBC. TV? Yes, in Los Angeles. She used to get press passes to the Bureau and stuff. In fact, we used to get some camera equipment from there. So a lot of this news film was probably turned over to the FBI. Oh, sure. It was definitely turned over. Oh, well, hey, they had a lot of reporters and, and it, well, you know, it was that, that old, that old game of one hand washes the other. Usually an agent would prefer to meet the reporter on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you understand what I mean? Build a rapport with him, you know, go out to the press club, buy him a few drinks, you know, take him out to Hollywood Park, you know, for the races, you know, that kind of thing. Say, uh, hey, Jim, you know, your, your paper's covering such and such, or your TV station's covering such and such. And, yeah, I just like a little bit more information than I've been getting. I need it, you know. It would kind of help me, you know what I mean? A personal favor. And if you do something for me, maybe I can do something for you, you know, in the future. Like, you know, and we, when we're about to break a case, you'll be the first to know. That kind of thing. What kind of work did you end up doing as an undercover agent? Were you doing espionage work or informant work? Informant work and also... Um, what she would call um, illegal entries, uh, selling of weapons, selling of explosives, uh, arson. You would sell weapons and explosives to these radical, so-called radical groups that you were joining? Yes. All right, where did you operate? I was given a cover name, Ed Riggs. With that, I was also given a birth certificate stating that both my parents were, uh, a birth certificate and a record for a Robert Riggs and a Mary Riggs who were deceased. And you lost all of your true identity? Uh, yes. And you operated in California? Uh, California. What cities in California? Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Chino, San Bernardino, Santa Cruz. Any other states since California? Yeah. Uh, Chicago, well, not, well, Chicago, New York, uh, made, made two trips to Washington, D.C. Uh, also, I better put in Seattle, Washington. That's very important, too. How does the FBI coordinate this information? You were one of a number of agents who were doing this. How did they correlate and coordinate this flow of information? How many agents, let's start with that, how many agents were working in a given city like L.A. in the late 60s? Jesus, 
Uh, we're talking about a lot of people. Uh, like I said before, in the state, I would say 700 to 1,000. In Los Angeles, which was a large concentrated area of blacks, we're talking about anywhere from 300 to 400 people. San Francisco, probably the same thing. That's a large concentration of black people. Wherever there was a large concentration of blacks or a large concentration of minorities. Uh, don't let me only say blacks because we're talking about the Chicanos and we're talking about the Chinese, too. But among every ethnic group, there were ethnic groups of that group who could be recruited by the FBI to infiltrate their own. Right. Just want to get a sense of how much money American taxpayers were laying out for this kind of exercise. What was your salary? When I started with the Bureau, I was uh, making, uh, what, $200 a week plus expenses. When I left the Bureau, I was making close to about $800 a week and uh, also some expenses, too. So it might run as high as $1,000 a week? Yes. It's according to what assignment you were put on at the time. And statewide, there were 750 agents. 700 to 1,000. It might have been more than 1,000 statewide. People are into a fantasy world when they believe that the Federal Bureau of Investigation finds out what it finds out through, through the method of scientific investigation that the agents can just go out and they can plot a course and they can follow a man everywhere and they take notes and such. That's not the name of the game. The name of the game is find someone that is close to that man or can get close to that man or that group or whatever and have him do the leg work. So in other words, there obviously then would have to be more informants than agents. Definitely. What would the ratio be? Oh, Ten to one? I think every, every special agent usually has anywhere from six to seven what I would call prime informants or agent provocateurs. Uh, and then also you have anywhere from 20 to 25 people per agent also that are not really what you would call the everyday uh, informant or agent provocateur, meaning that that person is not on a steady payroll by the Bureau, but every once in a while they will go to that person for information. What is your speculation on what recently happened in Miami? Would you suspect that there has been a number of agents that, or informants that have descended on Miami since that eruption? Oh, definitely, definitely. And not only from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, too. You'll have people from, from military intelligence. Um, military intelligence and the CIA. For the simple reason that they want to find out what... Well, the CIA and the military intelligence people want to find out, is there anything, is this anything connected with some kind of foreign agency? That's their prime objective. Uh, the Bureau wants to find out whether this was a organized uh, uh, type of uh, mass movement that's going on. Are there leaders? Are there central people that, that started this? They want to find that out. Who was, who was the one that was out there getting the group of people together and said, hey, let's go get this? You know, they want to know that. How would you tell a member of a community that they might be able to spot an informant. How is that possible? Can you spot one? Or what should one look for? Let's say someone in Liberty City. Well, it's like this. Um, informants come in all sizes, colors, and attitudes. Um, there is no definite way unless you can get hold of his telephone bill and if you can connect the number with a bureau office and you got it <laughs> you know but the fact that they're not working steady and yet are able to eat and get around doesn't mean anything uh not so much in the black communities that's one of the hard hard things because there's such thing as hustling and some people are known as good hustlers so people don't tend to trip off of him. Hey, you know, but I don't know how Blood did it. Blood probably did. Uh, he robbed somebody, or uh, hey, man, he's selling some weed, or whatever. You know. 
would it necessarily have to be a new face in the community? No. No, the fact is they, try, they tend to shy away from that. What they try to do is get someone that's already situated. It's much easier. Much, much easier. Uh, if they have what they call a prime informant, uh, one that has been trained, that knows how to, uh, to get into the group. Say he's with another group and he's made a name for himself. Okay, and then there is a group that the Bureau is interested in. Well, what they would like for him to do then is use his rep from the other group to deal with it. What do you base your conjecture or your statement that FBI operations and surveillance is more extensive today than it ever was? Why would there be? There doesn't seem to be the kind of organizations that existed in the 60s. Why would there be an even greater surveillance on the part of the government? Well, you have to you have to look at it from the standpoint that the Bureau looks at it. And to them, uh, organization or no organization, as long as there's one or two people or a handful of people that still think in the mold of some of the groups in the 60s, then they will be watching them. You can believe it. Then we moved into the area of budget, how the Bureau operates and manages its money. The FBI has holdings in, in different companies. Um, they have storefronts, uh, businesses. Wait a, wait a minute now. Mm -hmm. Why would they have holdings in companies, stock holdings in companies? Uh, it's extra money. Oh, you mean they get such a big budget and they may not use it in a particular year, so they invest in the stock market. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, the Bureau could, if, 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 if federal funding was cut off to the Bureau right now, it could still go at full budget, I guess, for the next, oh, five, maybe six years. Is it for this reason that the FBI has been able to uh, stand up against many other government agencies? You have to understand the person that started the Bureau and his... And his background, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar made an agency that was answerable to nobody but J. Edgar. Uh, there hasn't been a president that would dare call the FBI out on the carpet. Why? Why? Number one, just like they do background uh, or surveillance on us, I suspect they do it to quite a few people in, up there in the Capitol. Senators, presidents, vice presidents. Everybody's got a skeleton in his closet. And on top of that, he's rendered the FBI financially independent. Yes. Uh, the allotment for their budget has grown bigger and bigger with each year. Um, while yeah. I was in the Bureau for seven years, the, the budget grew bigger and bigger. It's a thing that the money, money's not spent, are always sent back to, you know, to, to the government. Okay, but if you notice, the Bureau never sends any money back. Never. It uses its total budget, which is almost unheard of, except for the CIA, and they do the same thing. Um, I guess being super super patriots, they always had to figure they always have to figure that someday maybe the government might become corrupt with communists and leftists and 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 black and communists and minorities and whatever, and that the FBI would have to function on its own bravely by itself. So J. Edgar Hoover had 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 the foresight to make sure that the FBI would have a little nest egg around so it could conquer these subversives, you know. And work west. Uh, what groups did you infiltrate in New York? In New York, it was the Black Panther Party, Queen section. How far into the organization did you get and how'd you do it? Uh, what I did was, I was a member of the party already in the California area. All I did was travel up and say I was checking out the party in the Queens area. Uh, what happened was, though, I only stayed with that assignment for, what, 
uh, two and a half days. We found out later, I mean, we found out then that it was infiltrated, infiltrated heavily by the New York Police Department. Uh, and there was no need for your there, services. There was no need for my services. Let's go back to the 60s. In the first interview, you touched on the fact that you were involved in some way in the robbery of arms from the armory, Captain weapons armory, from the armory. Yes. Give us the details and what just went down. What happened was, was that uh, the Black Liberation Army, excuse me, was in need of weapons. This was relayed to my supervising agent. By you? By me. Okay. Uh, he said, well, why don't you go back to them and tell them that you have a plan to get some weapons? What year was this incident? Um, Jesus, I don't really remember. Okay. All I don't right. really remember. Um, it was early 70s. I know that. Uh, what happened was, well, I didn't live that far from the Compton Armory. It was right up the street. Um, and what the plan was that I laid out to him that on parade day they only had one guard at the armory and it would be very easy to go in there and get the weapons. What role did the Bureau play in allowing you access or to facilitate access to rip off these arms? Oh, they, they, they worked out the whole thing. They, they made sure that, the, uh, that there were no guards, you know, except for I think it was was there one guard? I think there was one. No, there wasn't. There wasn't anybody, as a matter of fact. That was the thing that was, uh, that kind of made me nervous about the whole thing because I said, damn, you're supposed to have, it looks kind of phony when you go to an armory on a military base that's located near the Compton Watt area and there's no guard in there with the weapons? This is by day or by night? Uh, this happened during the day. What time of day? Morning? Uh, no, no, it was, uh, it was uh, late afternoon. So what happened? You went into the armory via, how did you get in? Uh, we, uh, what we did was... How we, many? Uh, were... It was uh, six of us all together. Okay. And we uh, cut the, um, there was a chain with a lock. We cut the chain, opened the gate, shimmied on in, got over to where the armory was, opened the door, nobody was there, took the weapons and split. <laughs> but the thing about it was the firing pins were taken out of the 16, the firing pins were taken out of the uh, 6 caliber machine guns, uh, the uh, grenade launchers, they were, they were ready, no doubt. They're, they were in anyone, nothing had been tampered with them, I couldn't understand that. Why would the Bureau be interested in collaborating to allow the theft of these weapons so that knowing that they were going to go to the SBA or the BLA? Well, it's, it's like this. Um, SLA, I'm sorry. Well, you have to, there's a thing called a controlled situation. And what is meant by controlled situation is that you know who has what and what they intend to do with it. Then also you can also have someone or something where you can exert a little pressure to make sure that they do such and such a thing. They don't deviate. And the Bureau was very into controlled situations. So in other words, when they got these weapons, they could then be uh, goaded or lured into getting into some activity that would make them vulnerable. Right. In other words, set up. Right. At this juncture, Perry began talking about a man called Elmer Geronimo Pratt, who Perry says is serving time for a crime he couldn't have committed. Gonna allow a person like Elmer Pratt to sit up nine years in jail for nothing. <coughs> the man did nothing, except that he was a leader in the Black Panther Party, and they wanted him out of the way. They? The Bureau. So, what happened? Well, there was a murder, right? The murder happened in Los Angeles. Elmer Pratt was in Oakland, okay? Elmer Pratt was under 24-hour surveillance, both physical and SE, electronic, okay? The, the Bureau, at any time, 
after LAPD picked up Elmer Pratt, could have went down there and said, hey, look, you made a mistake. The guy was in Oakland. Okay? They didn't. They sit back and let it happen because they wanted the man out of the way. It, 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 it's sick. Here's a man that got a bronze star and a silver star. Pratt. Pratt. Right. Elmer Geronimo Pratt. So when he got out of the service, he joined the Black Panther Party because it was a cause that he thought was just and he thought was right. Possibly, and I'm not saying, don't let me paint him a saint, the man possibly did some things, but he did not commit a murder. You know? And let me tell you something about Elmer Pratt. Uh, and, and this is from personal observation. The man was honest, the man was upright, and his word was his bound. You know? And he wouldn't go around doing a jive-ass robbery on a damn tennis court and, and kill someone? That's just not Elmer Pratt. He was set up, he was railroaded from the get. I'm surprised they didn't try to kill him in prison. And I'll be surprised if they don't attempt to do it now. Because now people are starting to make ways. Finally, people are starting to realize after the man's been in there nine years, and oh, oh by the way, four or four years of that was in solitary confinement. Was the Crompton Armory the only instance where you supplied arms to uh, liberation or black groups? Uh, no. I supplied handguns, a few other things, quite a few people. Uh, the Community Freedom School, uh, I um, gave them the ID, uh, the money, and told them the store to go to to purchase weapons, and what weapons to purchase. Have you witnessed murder? Uh, one. Fred Bennett. Were there ties to the Bureau involved in this murder? Uh, well, let me put it to you like this. Who's Fred today. Bennett? Fred Bennett was a um, sort of low-ranking Panther Party member in Oakland. Uh, he was with the national headquarters. Uh, uh, I found out later on that there was a great possibility or that that he might have been really a informant, but of a very low caliber. Well, what happened? What did you see? Well, I went up in a Jeep in the Santa Cruz Mountains with Jimmy Carr, Fred Bennett, and myself, and... Um, some white guy. Uh, oh, also, I was find out later on that the white guy was working for the Bureau also. Um, Mosier, I think his name was. What happened? Anyway, we get up there to the mountain, and Bennett says, you know, uh, we got an informant here. In the car? In the car. And when he said that, the first name that clicked through my head was he was expressing us. Uh, Jimmy Carr was not one to be trifling with. Uh, the brother had been in and out of prison all his life. Uh, for him to cut somebody's throat or to uh, possibly physically beat them to death would have been no problem. He was a big, big brother. Uh, the only thing that I could think of, well, the man's hands is on the steering wheel. Let me try to take his head off or he takes mine off. I was armed also. Uh, then... So what did you do? I jumped and I said, hey, what you talking about, man? And that's when he pulled his 357 and he said... Car? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm talking about Freddie. <laughs> and what I thought was going to happen, now when he stopped it, he took him out, he chastised him, right, slapped him around a lot. And then he took him up the hill. Uh, what I thought he was going to do was, you know, like beat the guy up severely, you know, break a leg, arm, whatever, you know, mess his head up a little chase and then leave him out there. The next thing I know, me and Mosier, the white guy, we're standing by the Jeep, and we hear 
three shots go off. And then the car comes down the hill and he says, hey, you guys got to help me get rid of the body. And I'm thinking, oh, he killed him. That's, you know, but the thing was also, I was saying, play it like it is, you know, don't act like you're going to panic or anything, you know. So we went back up the hill. The white boy was greatly agitated. I mean, he's scared. I mean, uh, excuse the expression. Uh, we went up there. He had almost actually decapitated the man. Have you ever seen a, a, a 357? Have you seen what he could do? Yeah. Yeah, well, his head was all, you know, like off. And we got some, some brush, some wood, and got some gasoline for the Jeep, and car poured it over the body and threw a match, and he burned the body up. And when I got back, I called up my supervising agent immediately and told him exactly what happened. And do you know they did not do a damn thing? The no. car. Mm. Nothing. George Jackson was a member of the controversial Black Panther Party who was killed while he was in prison. Reports saw that Jackson was trying to escape from prison when he was gunned down in the prison yard. Perry had some information about that. As I recall, there was a good deal of public uproar about him being in the slams. And the chances were pretty good that he was going to get out mm -hmm. because of this public pressure. If that's so, why would he be involved in such a sham attempt to break out of prison? Okay, let me put it to you like this. I think that, okay, you have to understand the psychology of prison per se itself. Every inmate fantasizes about breaking out. Let me put it to you like that. After you've been there a year or so, you're going to be thinking about how can I get out of this place. <coughs> the thing was, George Jackson thought that, and he probably thought correctly, that San Quentin officials under no circumstances were going to let that man walk away from that, from that prison alive. Uh, appeal or no appeal, probation or no probation. There are so many ways you can set a person up in prison, it's not funny, you know. I mean, uh, they want you, they'll get you. So not only because he hated the prison, but because his life was in jeopardy there. Oh, yeah. More, more so than, uh, I think more so that his life was in jeopardy. I was called by a group of um, so-called radical left in California to witness some fireworks up in Santa Cruz mountain area. When I talk about fireworks, I'm talking about explosives. Not 4th of July. Yeah. What happened when you went to witness this uh, testing of fireworks? I took a Porta Pack uh, unit with me, a Kai. Um, I um, videotaped the sequence of uh, how they used the uh, explosives, who was there. You know. What kind of explosives were they actually? Uh, they were, uh, let me see, plastic explosives and it, was, and, and it was a solution somewhat like nitroglycerin or nitroglycerin. Very high explosive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened after that? Okay, I, I found out through Carr and two of the other people there that this was supplying this to them. Uh, I went back with the videotape to the Bureau and I was later to find out that uh, also worked for the Bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what was the real purpose that this group was testing these fireworks? Uh, Did they tell you at the time? For a possible escape of George Jackson. Okay, so what happened? Uh, what happened was that um, James Carr, who was uh, better known as Jimmy Carr, who was like a second lieutenant to George Jackson, uh, also was one of his former cellmates, uh, was setting up a escape plan. Right. Okay. Now, the thing that is very confusing at this point to me is that through the information that I have and from the times that I spoke to Jimmy, uh, 
they were setting up the works, but they hadn't put anything in motion. Uh, in other words, they had been slipping certain items into Mr. Jackson at present through different means. But uh, the time wasn't right mm -hmm. at the time that George Jackson supposedly made the attempt. Um, but at any rate, a plan then was for someone to slip this stuff into prison and get it to either Jimmy Carr or George Jackson to effect a breakout. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Jimmy Carr was on the outside at that I'm time. I'm sorry, okay. okay. But it was slipped into George. Okay. It was slipped in. Okay. Because the same valve turned up after the so-called uh, prison breakout. If, if you remember, the day of the George Jackson assassination, and that's what the hell it was, uh, Vanetta Anderson supposedly went to uh, visit George Jackson. Uh, I am saying Vanetta Anderson did not visit George Jackson. I am saying that guys as a black woman went to visit George Jackson. Uh huh. And I am saying also that Stephen Bingham, the attorney, was used by and used by the way of handing the tape recorder to Stephen Bingham to, to Bingham to take in because there was no gun in that tape recorder. That gun was already inside there with George Jackson. But apparently then, not only had the nitro and stuff been slipped to Jackson, mm -hmm. but also there was a plan. And what was that plan? Uh, well, the plan that we knew about, or let me say, the plan that I knew about personally was the plan where um, they were supposed to blow the east wall of the prison. Uh, Jackson, in turn, was supposed to have uh, taken um, a... Um, a chain, some long metal object, thrown it around the wires and grounded it. All, that's cutting out the power to the present. And then escape off in the darkness with, with jeeps, with, with armed people that uh, Carr knew. But what actually did happen? What actually did happen, okay. Now this is only uh, a hypothesis on my part. Yeah. But what I think, since the present authorities and the Bureau were well aware of what Jackson was planning to do, that they forced his hand. Also, I believe that one of the guards had the 9mm pistol. Mm -hmm. There is no way in hell that George Jackson could have got that 9mm pistol smuggled in because that 9mm pistol was confiscated over a year ago from Landon Williams during a raid. Oakland Police Department had it in their possession. It went from the Oakland Police Department to the Bureau and from the Bureau, it disappeared. Up until the time Jackson supposedly had that snuck in where, you know, he hid it in a wig or whatever they said he did, whatever lie he came up with. So you're saying then that George Jackson was given these vials that were actually duds, and then he ran out thinking that it was nitro, threw it against the wall, ping, they didn't go off, and he was blown away. Right. And the thing that, that, that back facts that to the max is that the brother that went out with him also had two of the tubes. Uh, but the thing was, the prison authorities put him in a basket and they took the tubes out into the center of the yard and supposedly they stood back from a long distance and shot their weapons at it, breaking the tubes and the contents. You know, the contents all spilled out and so there was no way to examine those. They did find one tube, and that was in George's cell. But no one's ever been able to get their hands on it due to some legal process brought down by the Attorney General's office in California. What do you have to say about the church committee hearings? Do you feel that the church committee has revealed all the information that they've gathered? <laughs> no way. No way. No way. What percentage would you say they've released of the material from a personal viewpoint? Personal viewpoint, I'd say about 10%, if that. That's kind of stretching it, I believe. 
When you went to Washington to testify, you took a lot of evidence with you. Yes, I did. Physical evidence. Yes, I did. They kept that evidence. Yes, they did. Where is it? I have no idea. I have no idea. It was never made public. No, it wasn't. Was it strong evidence? It was very strong evidence. I mean, how strong can you get when you actually have the, the voice of the man speaking to you over the telephone, instructing you after you spill certain particular paperwork to burn that garage up? Uh, and he says his name. Uh, yeah. I think that's very strong evidence. Well, what do you make of their reticence in releasing this information? Well, let me put it to you like this. I think the whole thing was a farce. I think it was a setup. Uh, when I went up there, uh, I was interviewed by uh, some people from the Justice Department, which was cool. But then also they had two uh, agents from the Bureau that interviewed me for an hour concerning the information that they damn sure knew about. <laughs> you know. Uh, I think Church cooperated with uh, with the authorities to a great extent as far as holding back certain elements of things. You know, the Bureau has a good way of dealing with uh, with senators and congressmen. You know, when they when they try to release something on them, they say, "Hey, well, this file is still active, or this case is still actively going on, and if you release this pertinent information, then it will destroy the whole case." That kind of thing. So what is that called? There is a expression that they use for this. Uh, I'm trying to remember that expression. So it was a little, little legal terminology uh, in the interest of national security. Hmm. We've aired these interviews in the hope that we've provided information and food for thought. It's not our purpose to characterize Mr. Perry nor judge him. If you choose, however, to pass judgment on Dothard Perry, it might also be appropriate to question whether or not each of us bears some responsibility for having allowed things like this to occur and continue to this very day. You know you're going to go to prison, don't you, sooner or later? Or do you think you might get away? Uh, I don't think I'm going to prison. I really don't think I'm going to prison. Do you, are you in fear of your life? Not particularly. How uh, can that be? It's it's like this. Um, I mean, all the all the characters that you've been running with, and now you're turning and talking about them, naming names. Somebody's got to get warm. This interview, full face on camera, is a good chance it's going to be seen nationwide. Well, I take it like this. Um, I've played the game this long, I'll play the game out. Uh, I think I have a little bit more going for me now than I had before. I think people are aware of the position that I was in and why I was in the position I was in. And I don't think the Bureau under any circumstances wants to put their hands on me. The fact is, I think they're going to be uh, using most of their time denying that they've ever known me. The fact is, from, uh, when, when this stuff when I first came out with it uh, that was one of the things we've never talked to him before we don't know him <laughs> you know then later on it was a thing well yes uh, we know him but he, he never worked for us then the third thing that came out well yes he worked for us but he didn't work for us at the times he said he worked for us uh, <laughs> uh, I think they're more worried about people becoming aware of what's happening more so than me. In your career as an informer, you committed arson, you witnessed murder, you stole weapons and supplied them to certain groups under false pretenses, you procured information from people. That's an ugly mirror to hang up in front of your face, isn't it? Definitely. But then also, if, if you're thinking about the part of them pressing charges against me behind those actions that I did, you have to also think in part that uh, if they're going to press charges against me, then they have to press charges against them. 
How much would you say you've earned in your career as an informer? Have you ever thought about it? Um, no, not really. I, I, I would say anywhere in, in the seven-year seven, seven year period, I, I'd say anywhere between uh, $50,000, $60,000. Over a seven-year period? Over a seven-year period. It's not a lot of money. It's not it? a lot of money, no. Uh, per se, it really wasn't the money. It was the pressure. Uh, it, you'd be surprised at what uh, a squeeze in the right place can do to a person. Because if you had told me when I got out of the service that I would work for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I told you you were out of your mind. And you're saying to our audience today that there are many, many, many black people, brothers and sisters, who are caught in the same bind that you were in. Are worth. And are working for the government. Oh, yeah. Informing on our people. Definitely. Um, the thing that really irritates me about this whole situation is that of course, I, I know what I've done, you know, I'm well aware of that. Uh, I don't need to be reminded of it. But I think that black people in general need to be reminded of it because it's happening every day and it's happening in every city in this country. I doubt that there's a place between Alaska and California that is not happening to black people. But the thing that that gets me is that black people are sitting back and they're saying, yeah, well, get him. Yeah, you can get me. Big deal. You haven't hurt them one iota. Fact is, you did them a favor, if you really want to get down to it. You did them an immense favor because you, you killed the cat that was pulling your coattail and that's all they want anyway. You know, the thing is, is dealing directly with them use your use your lawmakers your 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 your, your, your so-called prestigious community leaders to go out there and start questioning these people letting them know that they're not going to allow this type of situation to happen anymore are you saying then that too many black folks today are apathetic and laying back in the cup that you don't see enough resentment to what has gone down definitely i'm saying that if I was part of the madness, and it makes me ill, and it makes me angry, and I can go out here and do what I'm doing now, and these are the people that it was being done to, and they don't even give a damn, then hey man, what's happening? You know, you tell me, you let me know. As far back as the 1920s, when he began as FBI director, Hoover had gone after persons like Marcus Garvey, Garvey's organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, had a membership numbering in the millions, and somehow Hoover found this threatening and worthy of surveillance and undermining attempts. Garvey's influence had been international and had drawn world attention to America's treatment of black people. Paul Robeson was another who was viewed by Hoover as an enemy. This reporter has personally examined thousands of FBI, CIA, and other U.S. government agency documents that were kept on Paul Robeson. Robeson, like Garvey, had an international audience at his command, and he used that platform to denounce racism in the United States. Most importantly, however, were the questions raised by the State Department as to my political opinion. Here's a question of whether one who wants to sing and act can have, as a citizen, political opinion. And uh, in attacking me, they suggested that when I was abroad, I spoke out against injustices to the Negro people in the United States. I certainly did. And the Supreme Court Justice just ruled, uh, Judge Warren, in the segregation cases, that world opinion had a lot to do with that uh, ruling, that our children, Negro children, can go to school like anybody else in the South. I'm very proud to have been a part of directing world opinion to precisely that condition. The second, that I fight for the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa. Uh, Bandung, the colored peoples of the world assembled and made it clear that nobody is going to tell them what to do. They're going to have the independence. I'm proud of that. When the 60s came, many factions of the civil rights movement had developed the same international perspective. Those of us uh, 
living in the United States who see ourselves as and who are in fact you know, descendants of the Africans who were brought to this country, who were enslaved, I mean, and who were rebelling and revolting now against our oppressive condition. And we are concerned about Africa. We see Africa as our motherland, and we feel that we have a responsibility to speak with as much passion as any other African on this issue. The United States government says that change must come in South Africa through peaceful means. That same government has over 500,000 troops in Vietnam fighting not white people, but brown Vietnamese. So it is small wonder that the civil rights movement was also subjected to heavy attack by Hoover. Billions of government dollars were spent in this direction. Many of these activities were not only unwarranted, but of questionable legality. The congressional hearings into the assassination of Dr. King bore this out. Two FBI agents testified before a Senate committee chaired by Senator Frank Church. I'm trying to find out what it was that impelled the, some part of the FBI to pursue Martin Luther King with such an obsession. And what I understood that answer to be is, first of all, it was not any suspicions of the commission of a federal crime. None of the literature showed up a single suggestion that Martin Luther King had committed or was about to commit a crime. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Yes, sir, but at this point, much of what was being done did involve challenges to local laws. And there is a very strong suggestion that King was seen as rallying the lawbreakers and would-be lawbreakers, albeit for a cause that, that, that sounded pure. But looking now in terms of, if we look at what might have gotten the Bureau started. And if we remember at the same time, he is extremely critical of the Bureau's own law enforcement efforts. And we see throughout these documents and the new left documents that it is taboo to criticize the Bureau right. and particularly the director. Well, did he ever, was he ever charged with uh, fomenting violence? Did he, ever, did he ever participate in violence? Was it ever alleged that he was about to be violent? That was no. the very opposite of his philosophy, Senator. No. So that it was neither the fear of commission of a crime or the commission of violence. Was there any serious charge that he himself was a communist? No such charge ever was made. So that what was left then was a decision on the part of some persons or person within the FBI that he should nevertheless be pursued. And replaced. And the basis for that apparently was political decision that he was dangerous or potentially dangerous to someone's notion of what uh, this country should be doing and a further theory that the FBI possessed the ability to enter into this field and to investigate and to intimidate and seek to neutralize and indeed replace a civil rights leader that they thought to be uh, politically uh, unacceptable. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. All right. And the tactics they used apparently uh, had no end. Um, microphonic uh, surveillance of hotel rooms. They included um, informants. They included um, sponsoring of uh, letters uh, signed by phony names to relatives and friends and organizers. They involved even plans to replace him with someone else the FBI was to select as a national civil rights leader. Is that correct? Yes, that plan uh, was didn't get very yeah, far. But, but it was seriously considered, and Mr. Hoover penned a note to that suggestion uh, commending its authors, did they not? Yes. Sorry. It also included um, a direct, uh, an indirect attempt to persuade the Pope not to see him. And many other people. A direct attempt to persuade uh, one of our major universities not to grant him a doctorate degree. That's correct. Uh, after the March on Washington, there was an acceleration. He was defined because of his speech in that demonstration in Washington as the most dangerous and effective leader in the country. 
and there was a paper battle between within the Bureau as to how best to attack him, and he was attacked. Uh, after Time Magazine named him as Man of the Year, again, the Bureau finds that reprehensible, believes it must attack and destroy. Uh, when he was given the Nobel Prize, again, they seek to discredit Dr. King with the persons who welcomed him back from that award. Uh, when he began to speak out against the Vietnam War, there's a new crescendo of efforts by the Bureau to discredit and destroy Dr. King. It is my uh, feeling that the assassination of Dr. King was a part of a conspiracy uh, in the country, and I do believe that uh, some individuals in very high places of our government were involved in this conspiracy. And it is the same conspiracy uh, that eliminated and destroyed President Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, uh, Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, uh, and so many other freedom and human rights individuals. I'm convinced that the government was involved at some level. Uh, I will never separate the conduct, the attitude of Hoover and the FBI from Dr. King's assassination. I never will do that. I think one of the most important things that come out in that investigation was that Martin Luther King in Memphis was in a white hotel and the FBI admitted that they leaked to the press that Dr. King was staying in a white hotel instead of a black hotel and it was that embarrassment that forced Dr. King to move into the Lorraine Hotel where he was killed. There are more questions regarding the FBI's role in the assassination of Dr. King. For example, why was Dr. King stripped of his protection just before he was killed in Memphis? Reporter Les Payne and myself interviewed police officer Ed Reddit of the Memphis Police Department, who told how he was mysteriously removed from his security post near Dr. King. However, later, his superior, Chief Holloman, denied doing so. Why do you feel you were pulled uh, away from your assignment of surveillance that day? Why, why do you think they pulled you away? I think because whoever pulled the trigger, I could identify. When there were complaints from somebody, did we reduce manpower at the Lorraine? Did we reduce manpower in no. the area? No, no. The Attorney's General in 1965 had for 25 years uh, authorized uh, wiretaps in a fairly widespread fashion. This was just one. Uh, at, at the very most, the only thing I can think of that I would have done, but I didn't even do that, was go talk to Bob Kennedy and, and uh, ask him about it. But uh, Mr. Katzenbach, in whom I also had great confidence, um, without giving me the details, uh, said that it was all right, that he had, um, that there were no, it was not being done anymore, it would not be done anymore, and that um, there was just nothing to worry about. I think the issue is the neo-fascist police state mentality that pervaded the intelligence community that uh, is a danger to America to this day. Malcolm X was kept under heavy FBI surveillance since he got out of prison back in 1953. As he rose to national prominence as the black Muslim's chief spokesman, he became aware that he was under close watch. Our desire, our prayer, that we can have a peaceful, intelligent rally here this afternoon. But at the same time, we see that they have surrounded us with many of their own agents in uniform and out of uniform that surveillance escalated into the infiltration of the nation of islam personal frailties were played upon jealousy arose and malcolm was ultimately ousted from that organization this caused an intense climate of rivalry that set the stage for malcolm's assassination in february of 1965. uh he was uh really declared uh, hypocrite at the time and uh, because of uh, some of the things that uh, he was saying in regards to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, may God be pleased with him, uh, a strong position was really taken against him. Um, the ministers, 
began to um, speak out against uh, the things that Malcolm was saying in regards to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, accusations that he uh, had made about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, he had uh, accused the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, for instance, of uh, fathering children and et cetera. And uh, you must understand that at that time, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to the Muslims then, was held in, in such high reverence as you would even think of any prophet being held in high reverence. And uh, this is the kind of love and admiration that uh, the Muslims at that time had for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So when uh, Minister Malcolm began to say those things, uh, it was taken as uh, an outright lie. I would say that, take for instance, um, one time in the uh, Muhammad Speaks at that time, uh, the newspaper printed uh, a, a big article concerning the chief hypocrite. And it actually had a, a picture of uh, uh, Malcolm's head, you know, rolling or bouncing down, down the street at that time. And, you know, the way that picture is depicted, you know, he has little horns on his head and things like this here. So, indirectly, uh, I would say that a very, very strong position was taken against him. Yes, he's immoral. You can't, you can't take nine teenage women and seduce them and give them babies and not tell me you're more, and then, then, then tell me you're moral. You could do it if you admitted you did it and admitted that the babies were yours. I'd, I'd shake your hand and call you a man. A good one, too. <laughs> but anytime you seduce teenage girls and make them be charged with adultery, make them hide your crime, why, you're not even a man, much less a, di a divine man. <laughs> so, uh, and, 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 and this is what he did. He took, he took at least nine that we know about. And I'm not speculating because he told this to me himself. Yes, that's why he wanted me dead, because he knew that as soon as I woke up, I'd tell it. The plan of action was basically uh, what uh, took place. Uh, me and uh, Leon, we took seats down in the front of the order barn, we came early. Um, we would drift into the uh, order barn. Um, if indeed there was a search, then we could never enter. There was no search, so uh, we drifted in just like uh, we had hoped to. Uh, Leon Davis and myself took seats uh, down front on the uh, left hand side. Uh, Benjamin and uh, William. William who carried the sort of shotgun, sat right behind us, you know. And uh, Wilbur sat somewhat uh, in the back, or almost in the middle. And our plan was, as soon as uh, the uh, brother came out to speak, that uh, Wilbur would throw the uh, smoke bomb to make a dis distraction. And that uh, William would uh, fire his uh, shotgun, and that uh, Leon and myself, we would uh, fire our weapons and then this uh, break for the door. And when I enter there with you, I bring before you the Minister Malcolm, and I pray that you and I will listen, listen, hear, and understand. Thank you. 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 As in Dr. King's assassination, a police superior has trouble with the truth. He tells reporters that two suspects were arrested at the Audubon. Later, official police reports say that one was arrested. Also, listen closely as the police official carefully handles the question about police on the scene. We have two suspects in custody now. Well, where were they arrested? Who fired the shot? I wouldn't know that at this time. Where were they arrested, sir? One of uh, these men uh, was arrested uh, on the street by one of our patrolmen close by. There were no police at this meeting, were there, Inspector? There were no uniformed policemen assigned inside this ball. No uniform police on the scene. Does this mean that police out of uniform were there? And if so, why didn't they take action? What were they doing there? This behavior pattern rings a bell of striking similarity with the behavior pattern of the CIA overseas. The church committee produced cables, demanded and got cables, which proved it traced the CIA's plan to kill Lumumba. 
Sid Gottlieb went, got on a plane and went to Leopoldville. Headquarters sent a cable saying, use the poison. Gottlieb was couriering the, uh, for the poison. The headquarters sent a cable saying, you have to use it promptly because it deteriorates. And they had a plan to try and get it into his toothpaste or give it to him in a Mickey at some social function. And uh, then there's a gap, and no cables, no explanation of what happened. Then uh, five weeks later, he's beaten to death on an airplane. And uh, unfortunately, though, the, the, the airplane was in the control of people who had uh, agency cryptonyms. And uh, the gap of what happened uh, has never been answered. The, the men who were involved and were responsible obviously aren't speaking out. And, uh, and there's no paper to prove anything. So perhaps the same tactics were used against the civil rights movement. Heavy infiltration of the ranks, spread the seeds of dissension, then step back and let the blood spill. As I see it, Mr. Chairman, it is for this committee to be able to figure out how to persuade the people of this country that indeed it did go on. And how shall we ensure that it never happened again? But it will happen repeatedly unless we can bring ourselves to understand and accept that it did go on. And, uh, and, and I say that as one who, who worked as a United States attorney with the Bureau and have enormous respect for its capacities in the field of kidnapping, bank robbery, and a lot of other things, but am appalled uh, to learn what the, if it's correct, the intelligence side of that Bureau was up to for so long. If we would like to believe that the FBI would do all this viciousness and all of these things to an individual and would stop short of killing him, then we're out of our mind. In America today, if we believe the CIA would deal with foreign assassinations and would not consider it at home, that's like saying the mafia runs crooked gambling tables in South America, but honest ones in America. It just ain't true. We've seen then how the decade of struggle ended. Many of the prominent figures like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were assassinated amidst an intense climate of hatred that government agencies were acutely aware of. In fact, the FBI contributed to creating the climate of hate. Moreover, the assassinations themselves appear to have been facilitated by an elaborate network of government and police agencies who were watching very closely every move that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were making and then at the same time, they disappeared, just as the assassinations occurred. But those were the leaders. What about the students, the troops of the movement? Well, they too were subjected to harassment. This document that you're looking at now shows how the FBI tried to divide factions within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And the Black Panther Party was also subjected to heavy, heavy surveillance. We knew the history of uh, the FBI's infiltration tactics in other organizations, particularly the American Communist Party. There was already um, a record compiled that showed that the FBI was even in charge of various branches of the Communist Party. So we understood that police tactic of infiltration. There was a situation where, in a sense, the white racism uh, was its own victim. Like, for racist reasons, uh, J. Edgar Hoover had not recruited black agents. He had a lot of white agents. And it takes time to train some black agents. In the meantime, uh, those white agents, try as they might, were not able to infiltrate our ranks because the Black Panther Party did not have any white members. Okay. And we relied upon uh, people that we knew. And we kept people that 
we didn't know on another level. And I think this is why um, we didn't suffer more, put it that way, because they did catch up and start a crash program of recruiting black agents, and they very quickly uh, filled that gap, but it took them about a year to do it. In the summer of 1978, I interviewed a man who worked as an informer for the FBI during the 1960s. His name is Dothard Perry, also known as Ed Riggs, also known as Bill Perry, also known as Othello. How were you paid? The pay was always in cash. Cash, and you would sign a card. It would go like this. A rendezvous or a drop-off point would be picked out either by yourself or the agent. You would meet the agent there. Uh, usually it would be in a vehicle. You get in the vehicle, he would hand you the money. He would tell you first to count the money. He would tell you the amount while you counted it. If the amount was there, he would then bring out a card. On that card would be for the week of such and such. In, in other words, the week was dated so-and-so has been paid the amount of. Then you would sign the card and then the agent would sign the card. The reason for this is that if uh, all of a sudden the IRS became very interested about where you were getting all this extra money from, you could always tell them to go back to the Bureau and the Bureau would have your cards on file. I see. Uh, were there such things as bonuses? Oh, yes. What were they paid for? Bonuses were paid for, um, suppose, while you were meeting with, um, or you were at a meeting with Bobby Seals, uh, Chulai of the Red Army happened to come to the meeting, too, which is something which would be a new development. That's, that's bonus time. In other words, a hot piece of information. Hot piece, very hot piece. Did you ever suffer pangs of conscience? Quite a few times. Quite a few times. I still suffer pangs of conscience. Uh, I suffer from the fact that a lot of people trusted me and I misused that trust. I suffer from the fact that uh, a lot of information that I gave out was the undoing of certain groups or certain people. Uh, I suffer from the fact that uh, I'm on the run constantly. Uh, I have no real life to speak of. Uh, you have no family life, really? You have uh, a wife? Uh, no, I don't have a wife. I do have a child. Uh, I can't see her uh, that often. I have to stay away from them because once I come around, uh, the Bureau shows up and harassment starts. Uh, I have very few close personal friends, no one to really confide in. Uh, it's, uh, it's like being uh, on the outside of a glass jar and everything is happening inside the jar but you're on the outside you can see it happening but you can't participate why have you decided to talk to me uh, for the simple reason I think this information should be she should should be getting out should be gotten should be put out to the public I think not only black people but everyone should become aware of what your so-called law enforcement agencies do to so-called enforce the law. Uh, because between you, myself, and the audience, uh, I've seen more felons in law enforcement than I have in present. Many would say, well, look, you yourself just got through saying that the BLA was involved in criminal activity. What's wrong with wanting to put them in prison? How would you answer them? I would answer them in this way. Um, first off, we have to understand why they did what they did. But I'm not even gonna go. I'm not even gonna go off into that psychological hoo-ha. What I'm gonna say is, when you become just as bad as the people that you go after, then uh, <laughs> there's nothing gained and a whole lot lost. 
You also were active in the infiltration of uh, many cultural groups. Before we go into that step by step, how much research and study did the FBI engage in of black culture in the late 60s? A great amount. Give me an idea. Uh, from the thing is, I, I, I can, uh, they have a file on every type of magazine uh, that blacks read. They have a file on, on, on the music. Music? Uh, music, dance, theater. Uh, actors, the comedians, you name it, man. And they would actually study these oh, yes. different... Oh, yes, definitely. What would they do with music? Uh, to understand the people, you have to understand the culture. To infiltrate, you have to understand. You had a lot of so-called white liberals that were infiltrating the so-called uh, black groups using the uh, uh, information that they had gathered from the studies of blacks. Um, you mean just to understand the behavior pattern of our people? Oh, yeah. I can, uh, you know, Will Heaton could name out some jams of Miles Davis that I hadn't even heard of. He could name off some, some books that I hadn't even read pertaining to black culture. Do you ever see agents actually studying oh, the yes. music of... Yes, yes. Yes, I, 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 I've seen them going over uh, even video portion of cultural events. Uh, the understanding, like when, okay, you have an organization like uh, uh, Leroy Jones Black House. You remember that. Okay, Leroy Jones's place, which was done on the uh, thing of tribalism. I, I, that's where I first heard the word kintu, mantu, hantu, hantu, these, these words uh, of the African continuum. Uh, you know, I, I learned that from an agent. He ran it down to me. They make in-depth in -depth studies of the personalities of the people they're dealing with, too, uh, uh, culturally. It always helps. When you, when, uh, it's a thing of, you can take their culture and use it against them. How large would you say an extensive a collection on our culture would you say the FBI has? Would you rate it as large as a particular library, like the Schomburg Library in Harlem? Or... I would rate it better. I would rate it better, and the, and the fact is that they go into details, details that we probably, probably would overlook. Uh, Will Heaton used to meet me in, in different places, you Ooh. know, Will Heaton, that was one of my super, uh, supervising agents. Uh, there is a certain bar in the Los Angeles area where people into black cultural things met, and Will Heaton used to meet me there. And he would go into very long and tiring conversations with some very articulate brothers about culture, African culture, and Afro-American culture. Tell me about some of the uh, cultural organizations that you infiltrated and what you did. PASLA, Mafunde, uh, Watts Writers Workshop, which they had The me Watts Writers Workshop? Yes. Uh, Watts Writers Workshop, which was one of the oldest established black uh, writers workshop. That Turn place it. was burned down. Yeah. Uh, the bureau had it burnt down. How do you know that? I, I know because I participated. I did the arson. You burned down the Watts Writers Workshop? Yes. Why did they want it to go? Uh, at the time, funding had been cut to the workshop, had been cut out. But it looked like there was a possibility of a grant being given back to the workshop. And if there was no theater, there would be no grant. How did you do it? Uh, two cans of kerosene, uh, a Purex bottle, gasoline, and a um, flare, highway flare. Why didn't you use more sophisticated stuff? Oh, no. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. You, 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 you're never overly sophisticated. It's too obvious. Uh, 
this way you make it look like, uh, you know, maybe somebody in the neighborhood that got kicked out of theater at one time got mad and came and burned the damn theater up, that kind of thing. But you were involved in this theater? I mean, didn't did get to you at all what you were? Hey, man, that got to me a great deal. I love that theater. I built the stage. You built the stage? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I got to the workshop, uh, the stage that had been, the original stage that had been built needed an extension on it. The original part of the stage was in terrible condition. They had no lighting system. I put the lighting system in myself. I put the stage in myself, and that was a stage, man, and that, that was a theater. It's a nice theater. Who was the director of that workshop? Harry Dolan. Harry Dolan. Some very, very uh, well-known artists supported that workshop, gave some money very, to it. Some very well-known artists came out of the Watts Writers Workshop. You know, uh, Glenn uh, Tubman. Uh, uh, Yapit Koto. Uh, Sidney Poirier used to come down there and give a class. Sammy Davis Jr. used to come down there all the time. Uh, Quincy Jones used to come there and give music classes. We had our own 8-track studio set up for uh, um, sound. We had our own sound room there. Was part of your other activities and responsibilities to uh, study the profiles of celebrities who were supportive of uh, organizations? Definitely, and especially, like I said, psychological backgrounds, weaknesses and strengths. Did he have a weakness for blondes? Did he have a weakness for money? Did he snort cocaine? Uh, did he smoke marijuana? Uh, uh, they even get into, oh, and that's, that's one thing the Bureau loves is their sexual background. Uh, they have files and files on different blacks, not only celebrities, but a lot of others, uh, sexual activity. What would they do with this information? Oh, that's used as a weakness. So they would feed these to these weaknesses? Yes. Did you see that happen? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Doc... Holiday, uh, who uh, is the, one of the leaders of the VGF Black Gorilla Family, which is a prison gang in the uh, California state prison system. Upon his release from prison, uh, a certain sister uh, made herself known to him at a nightclub, whereupon uh, he moved in with her and she picked up names, telephone numbers, information, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that lasted for a good three and a half months. Was this an unusual thing, or did this oh, no. happen often? No, that, that happens all the time. Did you yourself get involved in doing that? Yes. Give me an example. Uh, there was a gentleman that was on trial in Los Angeles that belonged to the BLA that had been busted in a southern state for a bank robbery but was brought with two other people to Los Angeles to stand trial for the machine gunning of a police officer in Los Angeles. I was supposed to warm my way into the infections of his sister and uh, whatever it took to get the information that I needed as far as what kind of defense they planned to use as, as to turn this information over to the federal prosecution. Did you do it? Uh, I got the information, and thank God I didn't have to go through with uh, uh, the actual thing of sexual activity. What do you mean, thank God? Uh, the sister was rather unappealing. How did you justify to the organizations in which you had infiltrated yourself that you were living on an $800 a week stipend or on an $800 a week standard of living when most of them were living hand to mouth. Well, hey, brother, you know, uh, I'm hustling, you know. I mean, hey, man, <laughs> you know, so a little of this on the side, a little of that on the side, you know, I get over, you know, that kind of thing. In other words, ain't nobody's business but mine where I get the money. So, uh, you know, everybody took it for granted that I was possibly doing a little dealing on the side.
that kind of thing. Hmm. Then also, uh, uh, everybody liked me for the simple reason that I would do things that I didn't have to do. I would go out of my way. You know, like Mafundi would have a pageant and they needed someone to do the sound setup for him. And I'd say, of course, I'll do it for you. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I was very well liked at one time in the community. Would you say to American citizens that this situation of surveillance and infiltration continues to this day? Oh, yes. On the dimension that you experienced? Probably much larger by now. Larger? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me let me let me put it to you like this each year everything gradually escalated up more and more so i figure uh... when i left it, it didn't stop escalating as they say one monkey does not stop anybody's show you mentioned sammy davis jr who at one time uh, it was reported gave money uh... to the black panther party i believe uh... were you ever assigned to look into that Yes, I was. Uh, I was told to uh, try to get as close to Mr. Davis or to anyone in his office as I could. I used to go up and have real chit chat, chummy chummy conversation with his personal secretary Ann at the Nine Thousand Building on Sunset. And I used to bring a Porter Pack video camera, and I used to go around and I would videotape the whole office. You mean celebrities would be coming into his office and you'd film them freely? Oh yeah. Didn't they question that? I'm from the Rice Writers Workshop. Yeah, right on, brother. You know, that kind of thing. No questions asked. Same thing with the NAACP Image Awards. You know, uh, they were very interested in people like Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, um, there was a uh, another black... Uh, in Los Angeles that they were very interested in because, uh, not Los Angeles, but in Sacramento, Nathaniel Colley, who's attorney for the NAACP. And I know Nat. And uh, they wanted information on him just for the simple reason that he's an attorney for the NAACP, which makes no sense to me, but may, must make a lot of sense to them because they use the information. You've been called upon to testify in Washington. Before who? Uh, before the Senate committee. I was called first to testify before the church committee. Uh, and I did go to Washington, D.C. I did testify to those people. And I want to say right now that uh, the committee was full of smack. They got loads and loads of information didn't even use it, didn't release it. Um, they, I had tapes that I offered to them in evidence against the Federal Bureau of Investigation with conversations of me and my supervising officer uh, where he's telling me to obtain certain articles for him by stealing. Don't get fingerprints on it. We can really use that. Uh, did you take the weapons over to such and such? Uh, the Church's Committee told me that um, they couldn't use the tapes because uh, the tapes were gotten by illegal means. What would you say about the composition of the committee panel that questioned you? Uh, I can say that's for the birds, too, because the same people that I was talking about were the same people on the, on, on, on the panel with the church's committee. What do you mean? When I came in the room to be interviewed by the so-called people from the church's committee, uh, the representatives from the Federal Bureau of Investigations were also in the room. FBI agents were a member of the church committee panel. Uh, they were there with the investigators for the church's committee asking questions just like the church's committee. And see, this is another thing that I, I find fault with, and this is another reason why I am not going to Washington, D.C., is that, again, I have been asked to come again for the second time. I am not going again for the simple reason that when... I went up there, I went up there with the idea that there were agencies investigating the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation investigating itself. You're on the lam, almost. Um, do you have a sense that you're going to be arrested and go to prison? Oh yeah, eventually. Eventually, when things come to a head, it has to. 
has to be that way. No other way around it. What would you say to citizens who sit and listen to what you've said and have a sense of frustration and helplessness? There are some agents, the old line agents, that disagree with the tactics that were used during the so-called COINTEL period. But one thing I don't want us to jump off of is that people always talk about, they're talking about COINTEL now so heavily. Uh, I'm not talking about COINTEL, I'm talking about a thing called BD, which was better known as Black Desk. The Black Desk was set up for a simple thing of infiltrating black organizations and black groups, whatever. Where was this black desk, or were there a number of them? There were a number of black desks, but the head black desk was in Washington, D.C., controlled by Sullivan. And the... Was he black? No. Mm hmm And what was the function of the black desks all over the country? I guess there were dozens. Uh, to, the function of the black desk was to monitor activity, social unrest, revolutionary groups, cultural groups, and such, in the black community and feed it into this central yes. desk and it still exists as far as i know yes we've seen a number of investigations into the assassination of uh, martin luther king we've seen an extended police trial of the assassination of malcolm x what you seem to say substantiates what many black people say out on the street that government agents or agencies knew that these assassinations were brewing and either participated in them or allowed them to take place. It would behoove black people, it would behoove all people, really, to question uh, so-called the cut-and-dry uh, <laughs> one lone assassin theory. Uh, the Bureau and other intelligence agencies are very good at conspiracies. They are very good at setting people up to be killed. They are very good at making innuendos so the person will be killed. City police don't know about it because they have policemen in there. They don't let black people form anything without some policemen in there. And while I was in the black Muslim movement, over the black Muslim movement, many of the police who were sent to infiltrate us, they're black, would tell me, say, look, I'm a cop, but I have to come. They would tell me. I knew the, 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 the Muslim movement was full of police. So don't you think anything is going down that they don't know about? The only thing that goes down is what they want to go down. And what they don't want to go down, they don't let it go down. Something else was used against the students that drove the final nails into the coffin, killing the movement. What stopped it, of course, uh, almost dead in its track, And not by any accident was a widespread and deliberately organized, he deliberately organized widespread use of drugs. The fact that a decision was made and I think uh, you, most of you familiar with the broadcast of the mafia uh, defector who uh, went on uh, public media uh, to declare what happened and outline in great detail the great plan of how to destroy the black youth of the nation, starting in New York. He said in a meeting 20 miles outside of New York City, the great decision was made. He said he didn't have to guess about it, and I, I, those who heard him uh, know that I'm quoting him almost verbatim, because uh, he was there. The decision was to concentrate the distribution of drugs on the black youth of the nation, starting in New York. Starting in New York, beginning in the elementary school, 
and that to punish even on the pain of death any of the distributors who invaded the white community or predominantly white schools. That New York and other large cities were to be divided up into districts. The district commander, black, was to be given any kind of car he wanted, Mercedes, uh, Rolls Royce, anything, because this would be a part of the sales pitch. The blacks just love fine cars, and he'd drive around through the community in his fine car, and some of his key assistants, and he'd be identified, he'd be known, and that sort of stuff. And so it, I, I, the stories, I'm not going any farther into it. But thus it began, and the spread over the country. And we fell for it. Now, one, one, one thing was, was important. That the thing to attract the blacks, more than any other thing, more than the drug itself, but to spread the word, have a number of key young people in it, and spread the word that this is the end thing. So that'll get them. Just say it's the end thing. And they'll brave the fires of hell to be a part of the end thing. So that's our story of the decade of struggle. We put together this film to pay particular homage and tribute to the extraordinary young people of that era. And we give the story to our young people of today in particular in the hope that they'll stop and think about much of the negativism that they're caught up in nowadays and try to understand why.